So this is for discovering or rediscovering Kash for those of you that have not been there. I know Kemal has been there, but he mostly he enjoys the view and a cold beer watching and listening uh, around him and not really underwater. So he will probably learn a lot about what goes on besides enjoying and doing farniente. Um, everybody here knows the location of Kash. So we are really the southernmost point of Turkey with Antioch, with Hatay. We're really as far south as you can go, uh, open to the Mediterranean, close to Cyprus, but located in the eastern part of the Mediterranean. So we will see what that will mean for all the changes or things that happen underwater. Let me start by talking a little bit about myself. Um, so I'm a scuba instructor and dive guide, and I love underwater, uh, taking underwater pictures. Underwater camera is my tool. And I spend a lot of time underwater, married. Uh, my wife is French and Tunisian, and I have two kids, two teenagers about to start helping me on the boat, I hope. Well, my French is from uh, the Lycée or the College Saint Joseph in Istanbul. So I already apologize for all the Franklish mistakes that I'll be making using sometimes French words pronounced the English way. And if you don't understand, just tell me. Uh, then I went to Toulouse for engineering, mechanical engineering, then to Orlando in central Florida did a PhD in industrial engineering, and we studied with Kemal, actually. We were his friends from high school, and then we met again in Florida in the mechanical engineering department for him and industrial engineering for me, and then he moved on and stayed there. And then me, I came back to Istanbul and started teaching at Boas University, 10 years or so, but the call of the wild, the call of the blue, I got rid of, I didn't want to live in a big city and moved to Kash year 2002. And since then I'm here. And because I believe in written culture and written transmission of information, I have two books about Kash, about Kash underwater. One is a guide with detailed maps and things and uh, 300 plus species recorded with camera. And then I have another book called Red Sea in the Med. And we're going to talk about this later, about all the changes that happened to the Mediterranean because uh, our situation in the Eastern Med. Uh, I'm thinking about talking about 45 minutes or so, seeing the history and geography of this beautiful area. Uh, and interesting places besides Kash that, that are very close, Kekova. And then of course the excursions and activities that you can do during your stay here. And anytime you have questions, please stop me. And uh, we, have, we have enough time to discuss everything. We spent some time about diving, my things that really changed my life. We're gonna talk about our jewel, the Kash Kekova Marine Protected Area. And then I'm gonna zoom in what happens underwater, which to me is quite interesting and to all the visitors also, I believe. So to begin with, a quick look at the history of this beautiful region called Lycia or Lycia. Um, looks like with all the records, uh, there have been people in this area since 3000 BC. They were called the Luka people or Luvi people. And there's the Luvi language that is a very old Anatolian language that may have influenced all the way to Italy with the people that moved around in this busy area. And we know that from all the uh, names of the mountains and the rivers in this language that have come through the ages to our time. But in the Bronze Age, definitely, this place was inhabited. And looking closer to the history of this location, we hear about this Luca people, first of all, in the first written treaty 
that have been made that has been made after a war between the Hittites or the Hittites, I believe the English call it, and the Egyptians around the year 1274 BC, in the 13th century BC. There was a war that really never ended, but during that war, he's talking about the Luka people, the seamen, uh, the sea people that were allies with the Anatolian Hittites, Hittites, Hattites, against the Egyptians. So these documents, the Terracotta documents, two of them are in uh, the Archaeology Museum in Istanbul, one of them in Berlin and in the Archaeology Museum, and in Egypt there's also engravings in Tebes, in the Tebes temple about this war. It looks like hostilities never ended, but on our purpose we know that the Luka people were there at that time. We also hear about uh, their alliance with Troy when Greeks came uh, after Paris and Helen uh, to attack this city. Uh, the Lycians sent one of their commanders, heroes, Sarpedon, that fought in this war with the Trojans. And uh, we have records of that on pottery or so. And the, those records say that he was killed by the uh, nephew of Achilles, uh, and he himself was killed by Hector, and Hector himself was killed by Achilles, and so forth. You know, the, the story of Iliad and Odysseus. Uh, also, this area, of course, is filled with mythology. Um, here's an example the Bellofontes, the Lycian hero on his winged horse Pegasus, killing the fire spitting monster uh, chimera. Uh, this is a picture that is exposed in the Musée Bonahello in Bayonne in France. Uh, and we definitely know about Leto, uh, who may have given, whose story may have given the name of Lycia to this region. There are two stories actually. One is that Lycia meaning the land of the light uh, from Lycos, meaning light, and also the story of Leto, which is, of course, like always in the mythology, uh, Zeus having love stories with beautiful women, and one of them being Leto, uh, Hera being very jealous, the, the real wife of Zeus, that really pursues Leto, sends her away, and and she tries to find a place to give birth to her children, which happens on a Greek island. And then she tries to come to this region for protection. And she arrives to the location called Leton right now, the city of Leto. But the story says that over there, the local people did not really want of her because of Hera's jealousy. So she got angry. She transformed all of the inhabitants into frogs and then the wolves took her away to protect her, and the word Lycia come from the word wolf in ancient Greek. Anyway, uh, Hera, for example, is present very much in this region as a religion that people followed with her two uh, children, Artemis and Apollon. Apollon has been the protecting god of the Lycia region. Uh, well, anyway, a lot of different empires or passed through this area and invaded this area, starting with the Persians in 300 BC. Uh, they had to be allied with the Persian stations and they, they were part of their forces that went all the way to Greece to invade Greece with the Persians. But as you know, they lost the war, the, the, the battle at Marathon, and they were, uh, they had to come back. And of course, during that time, there were earthquakes, very important earthquakes recorded around 600 BC that transformed this region. We're going to talk about that later. And this was followed by the invasion of Alexander the Great, and then by the Roman Empire, uh, during which uh, Lycia was given to 
the island of Rhodes and then taken back again and they were giving their liberty and then the Byzantine Empire uh, period. But during all that Roman and Byzantine period, uh, something very important that happened here is the Lycian Confederation or the Lycian League. They had already a confederation that they started very early at the end of the Bronze Age against the peoples that were arriving from the West. But now the Lycian Confederation is really a confederation of all the cities in the area that had representatives, three, two, or one. The big cities, six of them had three representatives in the Senate in Patara, in, the, in their capital at the time. And some cities had two, some cities got together to have one representative. But uh, as says Montesquieu, the French writer that wrote a book that is called The Spirit of the Laws, it was really a true democracy where cities as a confederation had something to say and voted for the exterior uh, dealings of the Lycian cities. Themselves, they were free to do whatever they wanted in their city, but when it came to everything to be done together, they decided together. So it was a Senate that was open to all the representatives of these cities, quite different than the democracy that we're talking about in Athens, for example, in earlier times where it was the citizens of one town, the free men in a town that took the decisions in their Senate. Uh, also, when the uh, Constitution of the United States was written, it is said that they studied the Lycian Confederation a lot. Uh, after the Byzantine times came the invasion of the Arabs. Uh, so the Muslim expansion started in the seventh century and arrived directly here. And it was really the end of the uh, way for most of the towns also along with the earthquakes that happened during that time, also during the years 1010 after AD. Uh, after the Arabs in the 11th century AD arrived the Turks, um, the Seljuk Sultanate, which won their battle against the Byzantine Empire in 1070. Uh, and then slowly the Turk tribes, Turkish tribes move into the area. The biggest tribe that arrived here is the Oghuz Turks. And they created a small kingdom, I would say, or a, they call this a Beylik, governed by a bay called Beylik of Teke. And this is why this peninsula was afterwards called the Peninsula of Teke. After that, of course, the 14th, 15th century arrived the Ottomans in this region and they included in their empire on their way to Egypt. And then of course, until after 1923, the Republic of Turkey. So it is a region very much loaded with history. Every time you go into a town, an old town, you see all traces of all these civilizations, one after another in every city. All these towns in this area, Karya, close to Halikarnassus and Bodrum, lots of, uh, Persian influence over there. Vichy has been governed by the Persians for a long time. And all these cities that are right now are visited on a trail called the Lycian Trail, starting from Fethiye all the way to Fazilis here, Kemer. It's a trail that you could really walk in three, four weeks slowly and enjoy each one of these antique cities on the way. Sometimes you go through the Maquis, through the small way path on the rocks. Sometimes you are on a regular uh, road, but most of the time you are in nature. So Kate Klo, thanks to her, we have a great way of going through this region by foot. And when you do this, as I said, you go through a lot of these antique towns. Most of the time, what people remember or realize is that the Lycians believed in life after death. So according to how rich they were uh, or their status within uh, this population, they made themselves uh, their tombs that would allow them to live comfortably in the afterlife. 
uh, those that did not have, they were not rich enough at very small uh, pigeonhole like uh, tombs dug into rock, rock facades like this. Of course, richer ones had really temple looking types, but dug into a facade. That's the first type of uh, rock tombs that we have here. And then if you were a very rich merchant or a king or a hero, you may have had the chance of building yourself a house type rock tomb. And it, they really look like houses where if you look closely, you see the representation of cedar tree trunks as if it was a wooden house, but it's exactly a typical Lishan house made out of rock instead of, uh, instead of cedar trees. And then of course you have the famous sarcophagus almost everywhere in the necropolis next to each uh, city. The famous one in Kash is this one here, uh, very close to my shop actually in the center of Kash. And it has inscriptions on it with the very old Lycian called the Mysian language, what they call the Lycian type B. So wherever you go, you will be seeing those sarcophagus or rock tombs everywhere. But of course also monuments like the city gates in Patara and the very famous Xantos, which was one of the first capitals, the first capital of the Lycian population. Um, from there, the artifacts that were found and uh, they were found. What you find here is mostly copies of the originals, but the originals are now in the British Museum in London. So if you go there, don't miss it. You have beautiful pieces, the Nereis monument and uh, frescoes from these monuments here. Santos actually is a town that has a sad history uh, during the Greek during the Persian invasion, when the inhabitants realized that all the soldiers were being killed by the Persians when they went out of the city walls, they locked the doors and they burned themselves to death. So they all committed suicide. And then the same thing happened again, the same way when the Romans invaded under the command, the commander Brutus, which was, it's written very sad to make this beautiful city live another very sad story. So the only people that survived, uh, actually from the first uh, invasion of the Persians, they, even the history of Rome, they tie it to the survival, the people surviving from that uh, tragedy, traveling all the way to Italy and starting the, the city of Rome. So it's part of the uh, stories that are told about the Roman uh, history also. Uh, Mira is very famous for his theater. Arikanda is a very beautiful city next to a mountainside on the way to Elmalu up in the mountains. We'll see those locations. And of course there are cultural places to visit. Uh, the church of St. Nicholas in Demre. St. Nicholas is, was the saint patron of the sailors and because of his very uh, affectionate ties to local children here was the beginning of the story about uh, uh, Father Christmas and Papa Noel uh, story. And Abdal Musa is one of the religious chiefs of the um, Alawit uh, Turks. Uh, that's the second biggest uh, sect in Turkey of the Muslim religion. So all these places can be visited as part of the cultural expeditions that we have in the area, very, very rich in culture, in history. And looking at the, this Teke Peninsula, uh, just quickly, you see there are two airports that you can use, Dalaman, it is at two hours from Kash and Antalya, three hours approximately from Kash, because it is, you have to go through the town uh, center with the traffic that it brings. And it's a city, it's a location, it's a peninsula with very high mountains, that arrive all the way to the sea with deep valleys and a lot of small lakes inside that allow all kinds of wildlife to survive. And all these valleys that really allowed all the agricultural activity high in the mountains to bring their merchandise or products to the cities on the coastline. 
but most of the traffic, most of the uh, visits in this peninsula arrive from the north, passing through the mountains and between Fethiye and Antalya, but the coastline really started to be developed in the years 70 or so, the first 1970, the first time I arrived here in 1981 myself without my family. I remember going through very small roads and stopping time to time so that dynamite was used to open up a small passage. So really Kash has the chance of this be delayed development and it gives itself a chance for alternative tourism really, not mass tourism but all the big hotels such as in Kemer, Antalya, Side and Alanya, all these beaches here. But here we have very few, very small beaches uh, all just small pebble beaches or so, uh, and no big hotels, and one major uh, beautiful beach here next to Patara, one of the longest, biggest beaches in the Mediterranean. So this region is really also quite rich with everything it has to offer in naturally. Naturally, all this area uh, that you see, all this green uh, vegetation here is cedar trees mostly, or pine trees, um, or juniper trees uh, that live in high altitude. And then you have all these valleys with a lot of fruits and agriculture. Uh, me, myself, I have close ties to this peninsula because in my, in my grand grand uh, parents' family, the last name was Tekeli, from Teke. So it looks like my ancestors were nomads from this area. They were sent to Greece in Drama, where they had a farm for a few generations and then came back during the First World War. So it looks like blood is calling me back to my ancestors land. And I came back here with the last name of Draman, which is born in Drama. So I came back to my ancestors land. So Here's Kash in the most southernmost part of this Teke Peninsula, with a beautiful peninsula here, uh, a natural port here uh, in a marina. So really you have the possibility of tying your boat back here, or if you don't want to be in a marina, you go here. This old port of Kash over here in a Greek island facing us. So this is the uh, this, this is the Greek island, another one, and another one, and this is Castellorizo or Maisti. We call it Maze. It's a very small island far away from the mainland. And of course, we do have friends there. They come here every Friday for the market, and we go there every whenever for a good dinner with some Uzo. But unfortunately, with this COVID times, the last two seasons, the ferries do not work right now. So hopefully, they will open up as soon as Europe opens up borders. Uh, what's interesting about this place is that, well, you see that it looks like a fault line over here. You'll see the same thing later on in other places. And waters get deep very, very fast. You know that, Joe, because when you go get out of this peninsula for a few hundred meters, you find depths of 100 meters and more. So this is why very close to the shore, we can have all these uh, free diving competitions. Uh, it's, a, it's very easy to do their logistics. You don't have to travel for hours to reach the depths that are needed. So it really is an area that has all kinds of um, characteristics for all kinds of activities. Here's the old port. Everything, there are no traffic lights in Kash. And the only time you hear horns, car horns, and when people from Istanbul are here for major big holidays, Istanbul or the big cities of Turkey. If not, you do everything on foot in this city. Once you arrive, get away from your car and walk. Hotels are nearby. Waters are very interesting. As all this geology around here is limestone, we have lots of caves and tunnels that arrive that the, the fresh waters to the sea and anytime you swim on the shore, you find waters that are between 19 and 20 degrees, even in the very heat of the summer, when you go diving and swimming, the temperatures of the water will be reaching 
28, 30 degrees sometimes, but close to the shore, you will always feel this fresh water. And of course, on our peninsula, if I go back to this picture around this area here, we have a beautiful um, antique theater, Hellenistic antique theater that has been renovated in which we have concerts and theater. So very small town that is unfortunately getting more and more developed, but that is unavoidable. And here's the latest visit visitor to our port. You may have heard of Mediterranean monk seals that are protected. There are only maybe six, 700 of them in the whole Mediterranean and maybe 200 or more or 300 on the Turkish coastline. So here's a female individual, almost one and a half years old, that is swimming around and eating the fish that are offered by uh, the local fishermen. Was this recently seen? This was like a month ago. Uh, and nice. I haven't seen it in the last week or so, but beginning of July or first two weeks, it was there. So we're hoping that come here is eating a lionfish given by the fishermen. So it's good to have them close to humans, but they should not be getting too close because once they get used to humans, then they will be asking for food. And sometimes, you know, wildlife gets aggressive asking and people may not like that. Uh, next to Kek next to Kash, here's another very interesting place that you, Joe, were, you were telling me about, Kekova. Now, we talked about all these earthquakes. Look at this line here. It looks like a fault line also, and it is an actual fault line. And real big earthquakes happened in 600 or so BC and then 1100 BC. So here we find ruins that are at the sea level or below because of these earthquakes. Uh, we do these trips to see uh, all these ruins with uh, sea kayaks leaving early in the morning. So you will be enjoying the view of this sunken city as they call it. And even if you do one west tour, we may we make you walk this little isthmus here for a kilometer or so to, to take you to Upper Lai, which is a very beautiful old ancient town, which has its port area in the water. So you can swim and snorkel on the ruins, on the ruins of the jetty. Uh, also, this town has been very important and famous until the Arab invasions, famous because of its uh, workshops where they smashed uh, the, uh, the ground seashells called murex from which they used to extract two small glands and used it to extract the color purple, a very expensive dye used by Roman nobles and emperors and so forth. It was punishable by death to use that color, that dye on your uh, costumes, on your uh, whatever you put on if you were not noble. So they got rich with the commerce of this activity. And also all this region had all this activity, all these port uh, areas, because that was the last location, last port on the mainland for the pilgrims on their way to Cyprus and then to Jerusalem. So a lot of traffic in the area. And because of that, they had a lot of pirates, lots of caves in the area that are called the pirate caves, right now used by tourists and if they let it happen by monk seals. Uh, but this, this castle was built by the Knights of Malta it's to be here to protect those pilgrims from the pirates. Yeah. And so it's really, again, is a location that is loaded with history. Whatever you do, boat trips or sea kayaking, you're in the middle of history. And then a visit to the castle is unavoidable beautiful area also for all kinds of activities. We do it with sea kayaks early in the morning before the tourist boats arrive. So it's one of the activities that we recommend
for everybody and also for divers. The last day that they are not diving, this is an activity for them to do. What do we do as Dragoman in this area? We talked about sea kayaks, wild nature, as you see the coastline, very, very beautiful. Uh, of course, right now, there are some little bays where you see some housing building construction activity, but until maybe 10 years ago, from Kash to Kekova, all that straight was one of the only places in the Turkish Mediterranean where there were no housing, there were no construction. But of course, all the little bays that are beautiful, some activity is going on right now, but still with our sea kayaks, we take you to where you don't see anybody. Uh, if you're lucky, you may even put on the sails when you have the back wind to help you sail without using your paddles. It's an activity for all ages. And here's one of those pirates caves near Kekova. What else do we do? Of course, hiking, mountain biking, hike, mountain biking up in the hills in the cedar forest and juniper uh, forests, especially in spring and fall. It may get a little hot in the summer, even if height gives you some kind of freshness, but when the sun is hitting still, uh, we don't do much in the month of August, but the rest of the year, uh, the hiking happens really on the Lishin Trail. So winter or spring or summer, you do have lots of occasions to get, dip in the water and get freshened every half, every hour or so between the hikes. And we are the only ones in Turkey doing what is called coast tearing, which we imported from Wales, uh, which you're like uh, spiders on the seashore trying to go uh, traverse this area. If you can walk, you walk. If you cannot pass through, you just, the aim is to climb up a little bit and then jump in those fresh waters I was talking about that are quite cold, even in the hot summer. So again, another activity I thought it was a little difficult for people of my age, but still the job is to climb a little bit and to jump and to stay in the water if you cannot really climb. So it's for everybody again. Um, of course, every time we walk, we are lucky enough to put together archeology, span botany and ornithology in most of the locations because grasslands, marshlands take all kinds of uh, show all kinds of interesting botanical aspects and birds, of course, that come and feed in the waters. So if you're lucky enough to be here in early spring, you will be seeing the Mediterranean orchids. And there's even an orchid, not this one, but very similar to this one that is endemic to Lycia. It's called the Lycian orchid, but you will find lots of plants that are endemic to Turkey and endemic to the beaches of Turkey. And here's another uh, wild orchid that is called the Italian man. I don't know why. Uh, birds also, when you go up in the hills, you find all these predators. And then whenever you have marshlands, you have seawater. And here are my two kids, uh, maybe seven, eight years ago, trying to catch some birds in their binoculars. So like when we go to Patara, lots of places on the shoreline, you have the archeology, span you're walking in the marshlands in the small pasture where you're close to all these ruins within history. And then you're studying the botanics and the, the birds in the same area. So most of the uh, locations we take to have also a good historical background. When it comes to diving, of course, that's my favorite. Uh, we are very close to most of our dive locations near the peninsula, as you see here on the map, and the Kash Archipelago, where we have shallow waters in the middle and deeper waters on the outside, and the same thing here. Big boat that can take all kinds of groups, uh, and the university that CNM is part of was here last week, Boazic University, and we also have a speedboat for special tours. Uh, we are lucky enough to have all these very close to Kash. So we can do one dive and come back and do the second dive and then come back later. Or right now we are doing one outing and two dives with small snacks in the middle. 
because we want to spend the whole afternoon for cleaning up and disinfecting the boat and the equipment because of the current situation. But we still do two dives a day. What do we see? All kinds of wrecks, antique wrecks. They are, of course, in the form of amphora piles or amphoras because the wood gets washed away with all these centuries in the water. And what's left is uh, terracotta. So beautiful pieces almost everywhere. But whenever you have lots of them together, it's a wreck site. And we do have antique anchors also of all kinds of rocks or uh, metal pieces used in this purpose. And then we have modern wrecks. Some of them, we sunk them ourselves, like this airplane that did the Korean War that was given to us by the Air Force. This uh, Coast Guard boat that was given to us by the Coast Guard. And also, I don't know how the governor of Antalya put this tank underwater uh, as a present. It's hard to Im imagine a story for this, but we just say it was dropped by, by accident by a military boat passing through. So it still makes a little rock and inside some interesting fish. But we do have a boat that a beautiful wreck that resulted after an accident that happened in the 60s and it's called the cotton wreck because it was a ship, a cargo ship carrying cotton balls. And the villagers for months found uh, cotton ballots in the uh, shoreline and then collected those. So they call it the cotton wreck. So beautiful things to see when it comes to wrecks. And of course, the region being limestone, lots of uh, ways, waterways and grottos that were opened up by the seas, by the waters uh, going in the Mediterranean. Here's a view from a place we call the canyon. Here's a major wall. And here's a tunnel that is really accessible to divers, not deeper than 30, 35 meters. We don't have coral in the Mediterranean. Not much here, but we do have button coral whenever the ultraviolet uh, cannot reach. So in these locations where we have grottos and caves and so forth, we do look and find those small button corals. Of course, all kinds of grass meadows whenever it's shallow and close to the sunshine. So lots of uh, sea life and culture and really wildlife that made this area a good candidate for a marine protected area. Actually, they said they were richer areas, uh, not that too many, but Kashkekova, they believed had a chance because of uh, the people living here that were positive about having a marine protection area here and that were dedicated to protect it like the uh, diving industry, the recreational diving industry and sea kayakers and the hikers and so forth. So we do have our marine protected area that actually got enlarged just a little bit lately. As you see those non-fishing zone, the, the white area now, a portion of it was outside the area, now it's inside. This area here was is also inside now the marine protected area and the non-fishing zone was enlarged. And similarly, all this part of uh, the bay after Kekova now is included within marine protected area. So it's a positive um, happening for us to see the marine protected area getting bigger and not getting smaller. And we divers, of course, do our best to monitor what goes on here. All our work has to do with following what happens with the seagrass meadows and the life, the underwater life here. And of course, we give detailed briefings to everybody and send them home with a little souvenir, like a small button that they can take home with a small contribution for the protection of the area. So you will get a lot of information when you arrive here. Lots of Mediterranean species, seahorses, cardinal fish, barracudas, groupers, Amberjack, very small ones like those nudibranch, branch, Mediterranean parrotfish that you find only in the Eastern Mediterranean. And of course, the two uh, turtles are quite uh, everywhere. The careta careta, the loggerhead turtle, 
that has been here a long time. And lately, uh, since 2013, we, have a made, we had a major arrival of green turtles. And unfortunately, they like to eat grass. And they have finished off most of our fine grass, which really hurts the environment, of course, because then when we have other predators arriving from somewhere else, and you don't have any seagrass meadows, the small animals don't have any place to hide. So we love them, but they should be eating somewhere else, something else, I don't know. But they finished it off and they, they moved away. Now we find a few individuals, not as much as we have seen, like 50, 60 of them maybe in the area in 2013. But what really is interesting in this area is the Lesepsian migration, which is uh, what happened here because of the Suez Canal. Uh, all the live creatures arriving from the Red Sea through the Suez, there was a canal even in the time of the Egyptians, but that was closed with erosion. But then it was opened up again for sea traffic. Of course, you don't have to go through all of Africa to get into the Mediterranean, thanks to this canal. But now they made it even larger and the mouth portion now, there are two canals at the end. So more and more waters are coming because it got larger and deeper. So what happens? You find a lot of species that you did not see before. Here are examples of fish that are everywhere. Those rabbit fish, uh, the two different kinds were the first ones to arrive and that occupied a dominating and invading uh, status because they really found a niche in the med and they grew up in big numbers and they started eating every grass, every algae on top of the rocks. Um, if we had big predators like the groupers and barracuda and so forth in masses in the Mediterranean, that would have helped control this population. But as we didn't, anything that arrives in the Mediterranean has a chance of surviving and developing more and more. So the squirrel fish, the hatchet fish have been here for a long time. The blue spotted cornet fish for the last 20 years, barracudas, very rare seahorses, we call them sea ponies, this variety, uh, goat fish, sideburn wrasse, bullseye cardinal fish, anything. You may be seeing more fish from the Red Sea in your dives than Mediterranean species. But the worst ones are the puffer fish. We have this big one here uh, that is really causing havoc uh, for fishermen because they eat everything in the nets and they even go for cannibalism when one of their friends get, gets caught. And here is one that has 40, four and a half kilos and more than 75 centimeters that was caught this month, beginning of July in the port of Kash. And, but the worst one is this very cute one the starry puffer fish that we also call the pygmy puffer fish. They are everywhere, everywhere in the shallows or so. I have seen hundreds of them in a dive moving towards the shoreline. So it looks like they get together in big groups to breed and they will attack anything that moves. And as a group, this picture is really uh, very sad for me because I'm like everybody else, a seahorse lover and those guys are really are uh, not in good so good terms with a seahorse so they will attack anything that moves you move a little bit of sand with your fingers at the end of your dive under your boat five or six of them will be arriving and looking unfortunately that's a big problem and the biggest of our, of our problems now is the lionfish beautiful fish very cute but such a predator such a great hunter now see this video, well, this is a juvenile, which is un even more beautiful than the grown up ones, but they are really bad hunters. Let's see one example in this video. Here's a lionfish following a baby flounder. They are very patient. They try to really block the fish or hypnotize them with their big wings and then when they will get close enough, as you will see, the little fish will have no chance.
it will get it will get closer open its mouth and suck it in so they don't really catch the fish by attacking they open up their mouths and suck it in um what can you do like here's another video those are the very common Turkish rats or rainbow rats that you see in beautiful colors that are trying to eat the eggs of the black damsels. So they also are quite nasty for that. And then you will be seeing slowly the lionfish moving in the scene and very, very slowly get close to those fish here. And of course it will try to get one. And zoom, it got one and luckily just got away. So <laughs> this one got lucky, but not everybody does. So this is what happens. We study, we study them, we catch them, we buy them from the fishermen, you'll see why. But we study all the contents of the stomach as part of a study here. This is very disappointing. These are baby slipper lobsters that are endangered. So one small animal that, that doesn't even make 17 centimeters with his head has eight of them in his stomach, baby lobsters. So everything, the shrimp, the crabs, mussels, uh, seashells, anything that moves, they'll swallow. Very bad. All the baby fish, all the juveniles and their own fish, luckily. And luckily, now we understand that the puffer fish are eating the babies of the lionfish also. So puffer fish may be helping us with that. What about the local predators? Are they doing anything about it? May, they may be slowly learning that lionfish are edible. Here's our baby, a grouper that is under protection in Turkey. You're not allowed to hunt it, fish it, whatever, by any means unless you're an unconscious restaurant owner. Uh, here's one beautiful grouper in cash that moves on top of a rock. And here is a lionfish just there. And it just there and it just goes hiding in a rock and fixes it and says, hmm, there's something edible here. And boom, tries to catch it. I don't know if it got it, I think it got some spikes in his nose, but at least he tried or she tried. So they're working on it. And this is what we do. We get these lionfish and we make fish and chips out of them. And you better try it when you get here because you'll be not only helping fishermen, but you'll be helping our marine protected area and you'll be enjoying a great dinner. So this is what one thing we can do uh, we are not allowed to hunt them as divers right now, but we are being told, and we are telling this to the governors also, that within the protection area, you should be hunting them by every means, even with divers, with harpoons, special equipment, and whatever you need, special boxes and special harpoons, because the biodiversity has to continue within the marine protected area, and then it will spread when the balance will be reached because you cannot stop this invasion. They're everywhere. They are deep, shallow here, there, everywhere. But you must get them out of the marine protected area so that biodiversity has a chance. You've been seeing what they are eating. So we're trying to still convince decision makers about letting us, letting a team of professionals that know what to do with the proper equipment to catch them. Because if you get this thing, you will hurt, it will hurt, but you may even be very bad if you're allergic to it. But again, if you know what you're doing, you can control the risks. Here's our mascot, very small fish that is only four to five centimeters long. It's beautiful, beautiful lips. This is a female. These are the first live pictures of this fish in the Mediterranean in 2014. We knew that it was there because of publications of fish taken out of nets, but 
first live pictures. This is a female, beautiful female that opened up to scare away another fish passing above itself. And here's the male showing off with his bigger dorsal wing wiggling around just to attract and impress the female, which we always do. Being, ma being a male is a difficult job, even in the, under, in the underwater. And here's a beautiful video of this fish moving around. Look at the lips, trying to suck in some sand and find something in there. So Joe, you, if you want to see this, you have to go diving. Yeah, you need the time, right? <laughs> <laughs> we've been looking for that for the whole dive around 10 14 meters for half an hour and if we find one we're happy if we That's don't beautiful. find one well bad luck but we are really fond of this creature here okay so here's another species that is in here for the last three to four years, the nine light cardinal fish, new arrival, big numbers now, and they are hiding within the spikes of the Red Sea urchin, hiding from the lionfish, for example, there's always one or two around. And what happens is that our local fish, now this is this cardinal fish, again, like all the other cardinal fish is quite interesting. It keeps the male ones have bigger mouths, bigger heads, and they keep the eggs in their mouth for protection. And they spit them out and back in to get some oxygen. But this is how they protect their babies, their next generation. And those guys are teaching our local fish about protection. These are the baby damselfish, Mediterranean, that are hiding within the same um, sea urchin coming from the Red Sea. This is what they call microevolution. Another one that arrived a couple of years ago, this goldfish is everywhere now, it's becoming invasive. You see how? Because our goldfish, our uh, Mediterranean goldfish are really only on the sand and these guys are everywhere. And there's always an adult protecting the babies, always. So this is why they're successful in getting invasive and whatever they do, the male ones to protect their kingdom, they fight. Here's an interesting footage of what they do. If you have two big ones in the same area, they will definitely fight until one of them says, I had enough, I'm gone. So this will go on for minutes and minutes and minutes until one of them gets tired. Looks like they're trying to break each other's mustache. So you have a chance of seeing that when you spend a lot of time underwater. Not every dive, of course, but now is the time when the waters are getting warmer. This is when they mate. All these things are from the Red Sea in this area. Calamari, crabs, sea hares, uh, Doris, plants, uh, sap sucking type of uh, Doris, even foraminifera that is making up the sand over here. We don't have sand, but we have foraminifera. When these small baby, minuscule animals die, the skeleton makes up the sand in this area. And uh, jellyfish, pygmy sea hares, another jellyfish, sea cucumber, mussels, shrimp, uh, anything you think that may be arriving from the Red Sea, shrimp also, there are here. Here's the last one, a picture I have taken like a week ago. This is the blue line parrotfish that was seen before in this area last year and even before somewhere else, but these are the first pictures I could take a couple of weeks ago, my first pictures. So another beautiful animal. Um, another grass eater, I would say, that is 
really trying to munch on the algae that's on top of the rocks. But it's not invasive right now. It's just moving around with the other Mediterranean power fish and rabbit fish, but it's, it's another beautiful animal. And what else? All these things have seen close by, but not yet in Kush. So every time we dive and we have a camera, we're always hoping to see a new one, a new arrival, which is really exciting for divers. Like these catfish are in Adana and Mersin, all the way west, I mean east, sorry, but not yet in Kush. And some of them are in deeper waters, but we're hoping we'll see them soon around here. So this is it, guys. Thank you for listening and for being so patient and staying until the end. You will get two presents when you come to Kush. Those two books will be yours when you arrive, if you don't have them yet. But if you do have them yet, you still have them. and You can offer them to a friend of yours. Thank you for being with me. Any questions? <laughs>